Hi, I'm Buzz Barstow. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering at Cornell. Uh, today I'd like to tell you about our work uh, in CALS about embracing biological solutions to the challenge of sustainable energy. Every time I get a little bit down about this problem, I come back to this article that was written by President Obama in his last week in office. The gist is, over the coming century, billions of people are going to leave poverty and enter the first world and aspire to live how Americans live. This could be one of the greatest opportunities ever presented to improve human health, well-being and inequality, but only if it's done right. The need for sustainable energy technologies has never been greater and it's only going to get greater over the next century. Our thesis is that over the last 80 years or so, Applied biology has revolutionized medicine with things like vaccines and antibiotics. And over the next 80 years or so, it's going to do the same for sustainable energy. Today's energy infrastructure is dominated by fossil fuels. Energy losses are high, and it's got a huge carbon footprint. But if we cast our mind's eye forward by a few decades, we can imagine creating a sustainable energy infrastructure where nuclear and renewables predominate. Transportation is completely integrated with the grid, and it's, it's got a zero or even negative carbon footprint, and it delivers five times as much power as the energy infrastructure does today. That means we're going to have to reinvent the, the energy infrastructure we have today that was developed over more than 100 years, and then build it four times over again before the end of the century. This is a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. Biology has got some of the tools we need to make this a reality. From room temperature and pressure catalysis, through to self-assembly, self-repair, and self-replication. There's no better example of this than photosynthesis. This takes about 80,000 terawatts of solar power, stores about 4,000 exajoules of solar power, per year as biomass, which corresponds to an instantaneous rate of about 130 terawatts. That's almost seven times as much power as all of civilization uses today. And nature does this without any human intervention and at low or even negative cost. For all the bad press they get, biomass and biofuels are probably the most successful solar energy storage and capture system yet invented. They contribute more to world primary energy than all the other renewables, including nuclear combined. That's an amazing first draft template to work with. Even when we do build this sustainable energy infrastructure, though, we're still going to have a lot of carbon dioxide left in the atmosphere. But again, I think biology gives us a template for solving that problem, and it gives us the tools to solve it, too. To explain why I'm so optimistic about this, I'm going to show you a graph of where the carbon was and where it is in the world today. I'm going to divide up all of the world's carbon into four pools. There's the atmosphere, it has about 560 gigatons of carbon atoms. There's the oceans, it's a much bigger reservoir of carbon. There are the plants, which I've colored in green. And then there's the soil. Over the course of the year, all of these pools interchange carbon. And this is driven mainly by energy input from the sun through photosynthesis. All of these fluxes, which I've highlighted as arrows, are in balance. And so no single pool shrinks or grows over the course of a year. Or at least it didn't until 1769, the start of the Industrial Revolution. When we added a fifth pool to the mix, the fossil fuels, and you'll notice it's much bigger than the atmosphere and it's much bigger than the plants. And we started drawing carbon from that. And today, we draw carbon at the rate of about seven gigatons a year. And that powers about 80% of world energy consumption. The oceans and the atmosphere have swelled in carbon from about 560 gigatons to about 760 gigatons. And this creates all the climate problems that we're seeing today. How could we solve this problem? 
I'm going to remove some of the labels that I put on to make things easier to see. So the first challenge is to cut off this fossil fuel flux. And we can do this with the help of a few biological technologies. The first are advanced materials that we could use in highly efficient transportation. We could potentially engineer microbes to make nuclear power safer, to help us sequester nuclear waste and mine nuclear fuel with low environmental impact. Viruses have been engineered to synthesize battery electrodes with low energy and carbon input and could revolutionize battery manufacturing one day. Biofuels cut out the need for using fossil fuels in car engines. And finally, we can imagine engineering microbes to mine and purify rare earth elements that are critical ingredients in sustainable energy technologies like wind turbines, electric vehicle motors, batteries. However, this still leaves excess carbon in the atmosphere. How can we deal with that? One technology in which Cornell is a world leader is pyrolysis and biochar. So we can take carbon out of the plants and we can store it in the soil, potentially for centuries or even longer. We can increase the photosynthetic flux of carbon through genetic engineering using technologies like enhanced photosynthesis and rewired carbon fixation where we combine renewable electricity and biological metabolism. We can take that increased biomass that we've generated and we can use biological catalysis to convert it to non-volatile forms like plastics that we can store. And I've created an additional polymer pool here. You can imagine converting all that CO2 into the atmosphere into a non-volatile plastic and storing it in the desert. We estimate that at most we'd have to take out about 400 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere. We can also potentially directly take carbon from the atmosphere and put them toward this storage pool. CO2 is already extracted from the oceans very slowly in a process called weathering that creates rocks. We can imagine accelerating this process with engineered microbes, giving us an additional sink of carbon dioxide to take it out of the atmosphere and store it permanently. Making this happen, though, is going to be a big challenge. But I think it's possible. Over the past 15 years or so, we've got incredibly powerful tools to write and edit genomes. However, we know far less about what to write and where to edit. Figuring out the genetic secrets of biology and then learning how to apply them to problems like climate change is central to Cal's mission. Finally, what can you do? First of all, don't lose hope that this problem can't be solved. Continue to enact world-leading climate legislation. However, cutting emissions and cutting energy alone won't satisfy the human need for a better life of many people around the world, and even in New York State. Have faith that technology, if it's done right, can reconcile economic growth and the solution to the climate problem. But recognize that this might take decades, and right now there's no good template for solving this problem. Don't be dogmatic about technologies that you support. Be willing to get behind technologies that might seem risky, like genetic engineering. But at the same time, develop a smart, forward-thinking regulatory framework around them to head off any potential problems. Recognize that you'll need to support this technology development potentially for decades to come. And when you do this, do this fairly and competitively. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.